Madam Fernandez retired as a dean, Lokmanya Tilak Medical College, uh, and was head of the department of neonatology. She is the founder trustee of uh, Sneha, an NGO working on health, nutrition, and violence in Mumbai's urban slums. She is also the founder of Romila Palliative Care Center. She started the first human milk bank in Asia and has developed many low-cost techniques for survival of neonates. Madam Fernandez is an astute teacher, excellent administrator, an emphatic philanthropist, a compassionate doctor, an inspirational role model, and a generous human being. She is so much more than one can ever verbalize. The Oration Award was named after Dr. Armida Fernandez on her retirement after serving as a professor and head of the neonatology and, uh, neonatology and dean of the institution. Every year at Dafpal CME, one of the senior pediatricians with a commendable work is awarded this oration. For this year's award, I call upon Dr. Shilpa Aroskov to introduce Dr. Vijay Yevle to give the Dr. Armida Fernandez oration. Thank you, Moralvai, sir, for giving me this opportunity, but I would say it's not an opportunity, it's actually a very daunting task because uh, someone whose vast experience spreads over more than 30 years and three decades, and his CV which I read was around 40 to 45 pages. Now for me to say all those things in just two minutes, Maggie two minutes noodles, is really a daunting task. So it is like giving Geeta ka full sarin two lines, so I'm going to give like a Shole picture ka ek chota sa trailer. So, um, there is this quote by Swami Vivekananda which says that, awake, arise and stop, not till the goal is reached. And our Dr. Vijay Yevle, I think he's lived his life by that quote. But the problem is he's always on the roll for goals and goals and goals. And his goals never get over. And in that whole journey, he's so inclusive that unke goal hamare goals ban jate hai. So uh, that is the most beautiful part about him. Now, I don't know in school as a student how he was, but I assume that he must be getting straight A's. And uh, even in college, all our science teachers are also here. So madam, even in science college, I think he must be an A-plus student. So I am going to introduce him with all straight A's today and give him A for this A's pediatrician of Navi Mumbai. So, uh, the first A I will start with. Sir is an astute clinician with great precision and perfection. And of course, that is a secret ingredient to the long queue of patients that I always see whenever I visit his hospital. And of course, no wonder because of that qualities, he is today leading and heading the Department of Pediatrics at Apollo Hospital. But what again inspires him is his quest to learn more and more and more. Because for him, his attitude is say no to I know it all attitude. He's an academician par excellent with more than 10 orations or maybe umpteen orations. He has been in charge of more than seven committees. A for administrator, we all know about his leadership skills he has been the national president of CIP in 2014, ACVIP chairman. He is a chief investigator for typhoid surveillance in Navi Mumbai. He was a COVID task force member last two years 
and uh, chairman Asia Pacific for antimicrobial resistance. So not only in India, from Shah Jahan se leke Sri Lanka tak, he is you know a very well known personality, and he has put the map of Navi Mumbai globally is what I can say. But he breathes and he lives by this one thing, and that is rationalize antibiotic policies. And believe me, this thing that what he conceived, this movement has spread like a wildfire, not only in India, but in all over the world. And in last five years in Navi Mumbai, as a pediatrician in Navi Mumbai, I can proudly say that the whole entire practice by pediatricians and the prescriptions have changed in a humongous way with Sir's this policy of rationalizing antibiotic policy. He is also an author. He has more than 30 publications, chief editor of Pediatric Infectious Disease Journals, written many books on tuberculosis, immunization, and lots. But he is also a mentor and a teacher to so many of us in the past 20 years. He's also a very ardent music lover. And, uh, but most importantly, for most of us, he's a very, very affectionate friend. I remember in 1999, when as a young fresher who had just passed MD, with dreams and eyes of becoming a neonatologist and you know becoming famous and having a successful practice, when I set my foot from Mumbai to Navi Mumbai, my aunt had taken me to Dr. Evelyn's house, and he was the first person and the first pediatrician I happened to meet in Navi Mumbai. And I remember that 30 minutes talk what I had with him, you know, that always lasted in my life forever. And he said, no, I really believe that women pediatricians should do more of NICU and neonatology and intensive care. And there's nothing like, you know, which childbearing women cannot do. And we really have paucity of women pediatricians. So Shilpa, just start, go ahead. And we all are there with you. And I think last 20 years has been proof to what he has said. All Jack and no play makes Jack a dull boy. So our Jack is not boring at all. He has a very good sense of humor, and I don't know whether everybody is aware, but his witty Hindi one-liners often sends us many times into splits and laughter. Lastly, he is Fevikolka Bond for us IP Navi Mumbai, because he is that cohesive force which in the last 25 years, whether it is junior, seniors, colleagues, contemporaries, he has kept the whole IAP Navi Mumbai branch, all of us united and bonded. Whatever arguments, differences comes, but ye fevikul ka bond ke karan, hamari branch hamesha, you know, kabhi toot nahi sakti hai. So after giving so many A's, I think the only B I can give him is say, I can say, sir, you are the best. And uh, with this privilege and pleasure, I invite Vijay Dinana Chauhan. No, I invite Vijay Narhariyevle, my dear friend, senior, and colleague, to deliver the oration today. So please. Come. While these slides come on at the outset, very good morning and thank you so much, Shilpa. Uh, it's really overwhelming and uh, I don't know how much of it I deserve. And uh, let me at the outset thank the committee of the Armida Fernandes oration for having selected me to deliver this oration in this prestigious conference. It's really a privilege to deliver an oration which stands in the name of one of the finest teachers in neonatology and pediatrics, one of the you know, great human being. And I have had the fortune of uh, being a student at Sion Hospital when she was in the you know, best years of her uh, academic and uh, clinical career at Sion Hospital. 
Madam sent a message that she is uh, unable to make it today, but uh, I, I, I wish Madam was uh, here to, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm missing her today. It's a special privilege because I'm delivering this oration in my branch, my branch of IAP Nabi Mumbai, when the IAP Nabi Mumbai is hosting this <laughs> Dafpal uh, CME. And thank you very much, Dr. Moralwar. He's the man who is responsible for whatever I am today. He and Dr. Nitin Shah, these are the two great <laughs> friend, philosopher, mentor, and guide who have really you know, made me what I am today. So it's been a long journey of over three decades. And uh, let me give an honest confession that my practice has changed over a period of time. And somehow I've, I got attracted to this antimicrobials and rational antimicrobial therapy. And then I'm sure many of you must be aware that when I was the national president of IAP, Antibi avoid antibiotic abuse mission was run and we rolled out a model on rational antibiotic practices. And since then, I have uh, tried to, you know, spread this message of, you know, preserving and using them judiciously. And fortunately, I have had the, uh, you know, company of uh, my very close colleague, Dr. Dhanya, who is also an infectious specialist and uh, very supportive and uh, uh, she has also helped me a lot in, you know, maintaining this uh, mission. So I thought, what else can be better than to talk on today? Antimicrobial stewardship from policy to practice. Now, over last several decades, there is an increasing consumption of antimicrobials globally. Now, this is a study between 2000 and 2010. And this decade saw almost 35% increase in the antimicrobial use. And as usual, India contributed the most. 25% of this increase came from the, our own country. And it's across all the classes of antibiotics. So cephalosporins, carbapenems, polymyxins, quinolones, and glucopeptides. WHO classified antibiotics in three groups, access, watch, and reserve. And access are the antibiotics that one should be using for most of the current required infections. And more than 60% of antimicrobial use should be from this access group. However, if you look at this data set, this is from 56 hospitals between 2012 and 2019. And what is seen is India, the use of ex the excess antibiotic is less than, say, about 30 to 40 percent. And we use a lot of watch category antibiotic, which have very high resistance potential, development of resistance potential. And they are the main targets of antibiotic, antimicrobial stewardship. And I'm sure you must have read this in Times of India on September 7 that 44% of antibiotics consumed in India today are unapproved and inappropriate. And today morning, there is a big news in Times of India again that ICMR has released its surveillance data carried out in the year 2021. They looked at about 3,000 isolates, which are MDR caused by superbugs from about 12 ICUs across 39 centers. And nearly you know, amongst the 3,000 isolates from the bloodstream and urine in fact, what is shocking and disheartening is nearly 40% of them succumb by the end of two weeks. So microbes have really conquered. We thought that we have conquered microbes, but it's the other way around. Microbes are really playing, playing havoc. Just remember rule of 30. This is, of course, from a Western uh, uh, document. And I'm sure it must be much more in our country. 30% of all hospitalized patients at any point of time receive antibiotic. 30% of the antibiotic prescription is inappropriate. Unfortunately, surgical prophylaxis, which is so well defined, and however, in one third of them it is inappropriate. And 30% is a huge cost 
towards antimicrobial in patient management. Antibodies are known to cause adverse events, but early and repeated antibiotic exposure has been implicated now in the causation of systemic onset juvenile arthritis, IBD, I mean JIA, IBD, asthma, and diabetes in children. So with this increase in AMR and the drying up antibiotic pipeline, AMR is now a global emergency. And the global action plan to tackle antimicrobial resistance, which was drawn in 2015, one of the five objectives was to optimize the antimicrobial medicine used in human beings, for which what is required is antimicrobial stewardship. Welcome Dr. Mohan Joshi, the Honorable Dean of Sion Hospital. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you amongst us. So I was talking about that antimicrobial stewardship, what is uh, required today. And what is stewardship? It's the careful and responsible management of something interested to one's care. And antimicrobial stewardship is nothing but a coordinated program that promotes appropriate use of antimicrobials, improves patient outcome, reduces microbial resistance, and also decreases the spread of infectious infections caused by multidrug pathogens. So it essentially is to improve antimicrobial prescribing by clinicians and used by patients, adhering to the five Ds, the correct drug, correct dose, correct delivery, the right dosing interval, and the right duration. And it also aims at measuring the antibiotic prescribing. And of course, when we say AMS, it does not mean not to use antibiotic. It also says that AMSP is to minimize misdiagnosis or delayed diagnosis and delayed use of antimicrobials where it is required. Now, there is a growing body of evidence which says that AMSPs, the antimicrobial stewardship programs across the globe, reduce antibiotic overuse while improving patient outcome. So it is, you know, without you know, any dispute that AMSP is something which would help us in the bad times where AMR is growing so well. However, implementation of AMSP has been a challenge all over the world. But one has to try until succeed. And there has to be a beginning. And today I'm going to talk something that is possible even at an individual level. Many of us have a feeling that AMSP is something that should be left to the institution. It is some public health program. And as an individual pediatrician, I have no role to play. No, that's not so. Let each one of us make an effort. There are very well laid down policies and core elements defined for implementation of antimicrobial stewardship, like leadership commitment, accountability, actions for implementation, education, so on and so forth. However, if you look at Indian hospitals or healthcare system, AMSP is almost rudimentary or non-existent. There was a survey which was carried out by ICMR and what they realized that it is marginally better in private care institution. The main reason being, it is one of the prerequisites for accreditation by, say, NABH or Joint Commission International. So there are a lot many barriers. First of all, AMSP is a resource-intensive intervention. There is very often lack of interest, partly because of these resources which are required. The lack of resources both financial and human resources or expertise. Lack of expertise, even if resources are made available, there is lack of expertise. We have very few ID specialists in the country, which is a main you know, component or element of uh, anti Solution Committee. There are gaps in laboratory capacity. It is unfortunate that even today, India does not have culture facility available all across the country. You go to the remotest place in rural India, there's, it's almost non-existent. And hence, there is a gap in ability to, you know, track the antibiotic use and conduct surveillance. Given the constraints, let us see how best at different levels we can try and implement antimicrobial stewardship. Many of us are into solo practice as individual pediatricians. Some of us have nursing homes, and many of us, some of us are attached to, you know, big hospitals uh, where we can be a part of antimicrobial stewardship policy and program. Let me take you through this example. Four-year-old boy who has come with 
uh, fever of two days, throat pain, throat congestion, as the tender jugulodiagastric lymph nodes. And the parents are pressurizing that they have to go out of station on the weekend three days later, and they are demanding an antibiotic. And I have a choice, azithromycin, coamoxicline, amoxicillin, or have a choice to wait and call the patient 48 hours later. I put history, clinical assessment together and try to think. I apply those central criteria. This child's cough plus minus, he says, kabhi khasta hai, kabhi nahi khasta hai. But he fulfills at least two criteria, three criteria. So a borderline case. Knowing that I can aff afford to wait, I wait and decide to review after 48 hours. At the end of 40 hours, when he comes back, he has now tonsillar exudate, his nodes are tender, he has difficulty in swallowing. I could have done a rapid streptococcal antigen test, which is very much available in my nursing home. And, you know, in borderline cases, I could have made a decision on using amoxicillin. However, now the picture is very clear. So I put this diagnosis on paper, acute bacterial tonsillitis, and start him on amoxicillin dispersible tablet 250 milligram, one and a half tablet two times a day orally for 10 days to be dissolved in one, two teaspoon of drinking water and to be administered orally. And I make it a point to talk to the parents. I make a statement that unlike in the past, unfortunately, I'm afraid I have to use an antibiotic on your child this time. And I also impress upon the parent the need of completing the course because I am aiming at eradicating the streptococcus from the throat. So there is a need to complete the course as prescribed. So what have I done? I have done a thorough clinical assessment, history and clinical examination. I have tried to implement the standard guidelines which are available. It's uh, or the RTI GEM guideline rolled out by IAP. I have put a justification for using antimicrobial. I have adhered to the five Ds in terms of drug dose, delivery dosing, and duration. And I have utilized this opportunity to educate my patient about the need to complete why the child needs antibiotic and why she has to adhere to the prescription that I have made. And then knowing well that amoxicillin, azithromycin, coamoxiclav are other agents which are very often used in this condition, I would also try and sensitize and educate my fellow colleagues on the right antibiotic, antibiotic the right way of diagnosing active bacterial tonsillitis, so on and so forth. So this is nothing but your antimicrobial stewardship. So at an individual level, you, it has to come from within. Commit to implementing antimicrobial stewardship. Now IAP Navi Mumbai, what we did, we designed this poster and distributed to all the members. This is one way to display your commitment. Having displayed a poster like this, you would think 100 times before penning down an antibiotic. You display this poster in the waiting area, your patients become aware, they start asking you, doctor, what is it all about? We conducted a survey, even in the young population, so-called educated population in Navi Mumbai, not all are literate about what an antibiotic is, what is AMR, so on and so forth. You need to improve antibiotic prescribing, both empirical and definite, and prophylaxis. So how do you improve antibiotic prescribing? So there are certain agents which are overprescribed. Coamoxiclav, ever since it has come under drug price control, that is the first line antibiotic used by almost all of us. There are a few conditions which are overdiagnosed. Bacterial pharyngotonsillitis. More often than not in clinical practice, it is viral. Very often we use wrong agents. Say for example, cefixim for treating a patch. And there are opportunities to delay antibiotic writing, like the example that I cited, or myelotitis media, where you can defer using antibiotic. So we need to identify these conditions where we over-prescribe antibiotic. And fever, sore throat, acute respiratory infection, UTI are few common conditions that we must target. I have already talked about sore throat. Fever is yet another condition where a lot of antibiotic abuse happens. Three-year-old boy, fever for two days, no significant findings on examination. And we ask those five, six questions. Degree of fever at onset, interfibral period, response to paracetamol, trend and associated symptoms. This has been taught to us. At this point of time, let me disclose that 24 investigators from Mumbai and Navi Mumbai. IAP Mumbai Mumbai has taken a project and we are trying to validate this clinical score so as to you know, 
offer simple rules to the practicing pediatrician that if you fulfill this criteria, there is a scoring system, then it tells you that this is unlikely to be bacterial and not to use antibiotic. And of course, if there are red flags, we would investigate and use antibiotic. So the point that I'm trying to make is there are ample guidelines. What is required is applying those guidelines in clinical practice and adhe adhering to rationalizing antibiotic use. Fortunately, rapid tests are available today. Say in this season, you have acute febrile illness without focus, do NS1, and that is positive. You know that you are dealing with the case of dengue, and this child does not require an antibiotic. Second common condition is acute respiratory infection. Two-year-old boy, fever, cough, rapid breathing, seen by a junior doctor on duty in the nursing home, and then his prescribed coamoxiclam. Now, we know very well that this could be one of those, you know, a respiratory tract disease where airways are involved. See, for a WHO ASHA worker, it is fine that fever, cough, rapid breathing prescribe an antibiotic. Pediatrician has to go beyond and try to analyze. And if you look at these four conditions, three of them don't require an antibiotic. So how can we make this change? Again, what it requires is updating yourself, keeping yourself abreast, training yourself, retraining, and adhering to the standard guidelines. IAP has rolled out so many modules in last a decade or so that even if a young pediatrician goes through all those modules, I'm so confident it'll be, uh, you know, much more rational. Empiric antibiotic policy beautifully outlined in the rational antibiotic practice module. So make use of these guidelines. Today, smartphones are available. Make use of the guidelines which are so easily available on smartphones. Urine tract infection is yeah, yet another condition where antibody abuse happens. So unless you have a strong clinical suspicion, please don't investigate for UTI. Ensure that a clean catch is obtained. Very often we casually tell, get urine routine and culture done. You need to you know, counsel the parents and teach them actually how to collect a clean catch. And then timely transport and laboratory, to the laboratory or storage if you're unable to transport is extremely important. Otherwise your diagnosis will go for a toss. Then after having received the report, you need to interpret it properly. Very often asymptomatic bacteria, when urine is done for something else, shows gross organism and is treated. We must refrain from treating asymptomatic bacteria with antibiotic. Dr. Pankaj Deshpande, who is a pediatric nephrologist from uh, Navi Mumbai, has proposed this algorithm. You have a child with fever 13 degrees or more and urinary symptoms, urine shows leukocyturia, you start antibiotic after sending culture. However, if the fever is not high and urine shows pus cells, you wait for the culture report and start antibiotic. If this child improves, even though the culture comes positive, think twice, don't jump to starting an antibiotic because very often we don't adhere to the standard urine collection practice and we tend to overdiagnose urine tract infection. If this child comes to a fever, start antibiotic. Older girl with frequency urgency dysuria is often labeled as cystitis. You do thorough clinical examination, look for vulval redness, look, give emollient cream. If symptoms improve, it is not UTI. Some girls who are obsessed with hygiene, they keep rubbing the, and washing the genitals very often. And what you get as leukocyturia is not an infection. Simple emollient cream suffices. And then most importantly, very often you have symptoms in other system and a child with ARI you get leukocyturia and you tend to do culture don't adhere to the proper uh, you know collection uh, methodology you grow something and you over diagnose UTI and treat it. Empiric antibiotic is used very often in clinical practice again adhere to this criteria unless you are clinically certain that it is bacterial uh, you know infection don't start antibiotic. Or there are situations where waiting is risky, you do appropriate labs and then start antibiotic. Or if you have an atypical course of a viral illness, you may start antibiotic. Prophylaxis is something which is, again, you know, abused rampantly. Remember, prophylaxis is against a specific pathogen in a susceptible host for a defined, definite period of time. You can't go on offering prophylaxis for a lifetime for every you know, garden variety URI, just to play it safe and to prevent secondary bacterial infection. God is not so cruel. You also tend, must try and self-evaluate antibiotic prescribing. 
practices. But I said AMSP is also measuring antibiotic use. All of us doctors, we fill Form 3C for our chartered accountant. You could look at your prescription at the end of the day, week, or once in a fortnight, and just note down how much of antibiotic you have used on OPD basis. You can keep a chart and compare your own trend over a period of time after having implemented some measures to rationalize antibiotic prescribing. This audit should also include the choice that you have made. Ensure that you don't use second choice agents for a common condition like bacteria. You should also ensure that review whether diagnostic criteria have been met or not. You should also try and adhere to the guidelines while making diagnosis or treating a patient. And of course, ensure that the five Ds are met. So keep all these you know, parameters when you try to self-audit your antimicrobial use. And then one can say that you are making an attempt to implement AMSP in practice. And finally, use effective communication strategy to educate patients. This is the theme this year of Antimicrobial Awareness Week. Be antibiotic aware, smart use, best care. N number of posters are available for in the domain to download. Display such posters. And that would really help create awareness because that is one important aspect to prevent antibiotic abuse by public, which is also, education is also a component or a, an essential element of antimicrobial stewardship. So all of us cannot do everything together. So I have one step at a time approach, implement certain actions in stepwise manner. Start adhering to the guideline. Use delayed prescribing practices where possible. And this can be achieved only by training. Training, retraining, and retraining. And then there are certain barriers. Let us accept that lack of knowledge and confidence is an important barrier. There are many DC students who are working with us. I get a call from Surat from one of the students. He says that, sir, sab samajhta hai, but somehow all our colleagues prescribe antibiotic. Mera guts nahi hota, I write an antibiotic. I attended a workshop in uh, Ahmedabad on AMSP. And when we showed a slide on lobar pneumonia, the delegates were asked, what is the choice of antibiotic? One delegate was candid. He said, in this hall it is amoxicillin, but on Monday when I go, it will be coamoxiclav. So let's not have that lack of confidence. Patient load. We see hundreds and 200 patients in a very short period of time and not left with time to counsel parents. And very often we are pressurized that patient may be unsatisfied, go unsatisfied if I, dissatisfied if I don't write an antibiotic. Let us come out of it. And don't succumb to patient's demand. So these are barriers which are easy to overcome. And these things can immediately go. That no antibody for leaky gut, no antibody for leaky diarrhea. And every newborn baby is precious. So there's nothing special about the LACS delivered baby. So stop writing antibody there. So let me take you to another example which is very common in the nursing home setting. Five-year-old boy, three days high fever, continuous fever, sick looking child, liver spleen just palpable. You have sent these labs, suspected enteric fever, started septrax on 100 mg per kg per day in two divided doses. These are the reports, NS1 is negative, normal counts, neutrophilic counts, CRP is high. At 72 hours, fever persists, but by then your cultures are available. It goes MDR uh, typhoid, which is sensitive to septrax on azithromycin. You are in a dilemma whether azithromycin should be used or not. You talk to your colleague, she says, no, it can take time to respond. So you hold on to septrax on. Child becomes afibril on day six. And then you switch from IV to per oral in a timely manner since the child has started accepting and discharge this child, again explain the parent that he has to take beta lactam for 14 days uh, so that there is no relapse. So what have I done? I have practiced the algorithm which is in place in my nursing home. I have followed the clinical pathway, made use of lab tests including the rapid test of NS1. I have sent culture before starting antibiotic. Antibiotic selection has been consistent with the local guideline and the antibiogram. I have revisited after the culture reports are made available. I use the antibiotic prescribing bundle, which talks about indication, start date, plan days of therapy, so on and so forth. Then I reviewed this child at 72 hours of starting antibiotic, what is known as antibiotic timeout. Is it a bacterial infection? Is the choice most appropriate? Can the spectrum be narrowed? And will an expert opinion help? 
This is something that we must start doing. Antibiotic timeout is extremely important for antimicrobial stewardship. It is a strategy to, strategy to improve clinician to reevaluate antibiotic prescription or appropriateness once the results are made available. And then have timely switched over from IV to oral. This is antimicrobial stewardship. So in a nursing home setting, there are certain actions you can start implementing. Develop and implement algorithms for assessment of patients. Because very often our juniors attend to the patients in our absence. Train them. Establish best practice for use of microbiology testing. Have a tie with microbiology lab. Ensure that microbiology facilities are made available. Knowledge of local antibiogram is extremely important. Talk to your microbiologist and know the local antibiogram. Develop condition-specific treatment recommendations for common syndromes. Antibiotic prescribing model is important. Perform antibiotic timeouts. Review antibiotic prescription in terms of those five Ds. Reduce prolonged antibiotic treatment course for common infection. Pneumonia hai, do hafta de diya. Let's not do that. But at the same time, when it is enteric fever and using beta lactam, ensure that the child takes antibiotic for 14 days. Review the antibiotic agents available in the facility. There's no point in no, you know, writing something which is not available. And of course, that component of measuring the antibiotic use. You look at the process measure, whether you are putting just a few note or not, whether you are following the standard treatment guideline, performing antibiotic timeout, de-escalation at right time, switch from IV to oral, and completing duration. You can also look at the outcome measure by noting down the number of patients that visit for adverse reactions following antibiotic. Mortality, of course, we would not talk much about mortality in a small nursing home kind of setup. Look at the MDR infection load that you have with your practice. You, you may look at the cost also. And then finally, antibiotic use measure. There are daily defined dose, which is a standard metric used to uh, measure the antibiotic use. More relevant in an adult practice. However, in pediatric, what is done is the uh, days of antibiotic, uh, days of therapy uh, per, per thousand patient days. And then now we have that aware classification. As I said, more than 60% of your antibody use should be from the access group of antibiotic. So implementing aware is also very important. It improves overall quality of antibiotic use. You can set a benchmark and try to improve having applied this classification. And it can be done by a solo clinician also. So again, make a commitment, take a pledge, write and display this com commitment and identify one amongst the nursing home peers to take the lead. Like in my setup, it is Dhanya who does it. Now, let me take you one final example. This is a one-year-old boy with high fever for two days, tachycardia, CRT prolonged, cold extremities. Patient is in shock. Cultures are drawn. Feeding tube is passed in. Urine is collected. And vancomycin and meropenem is pushed in. The moment these antibiotics are used, there is a message which, which is sent to the AMSP team of the hospital which comprises of at least ID physician or physician trained in ID, microbiologist and pharmacist. These are bare minimum comp you know, members of AMSP team. The clinician is asked to fill in the justification form why Vanco and Meropenem is started. These are the results. You know now that it is perhaps urinary tract infection, urosepsis. Blood cultures are made available. Blood culture grows E. coli. Microbiologist contacts you. And then the AMSP team comes and tells you, look, you have grown e uh, you know, gram-negative bacteria, so vancomycin can go off. Vancomycin is deleted. Now next day you have sensitivity report, which says this is non-ESBL E. coli. So there is an opportunity for de-escalation. Your team of ASP in the hospital discusses with you what is known as you know, prospective audit and feedback, a handshake kind of antimicrobial stewardship. And then in consultation with you, he you know, suggests that you could de-escalate to septraxone since this is not an ESB organism. On day six, the baby becomes afebrile, feeding well. You change to oral cephexim, timely IV2 per oral switch. You again discharge this child on antibiotic for two weeks, urosepsis in a one-year-old child. Advise appropriate investigations and put this baby on cephalexin prophylaxis until you have ruled out any anatomic abnormality. So again, this is nothing but completeness of your clinical assessment, use of microbiology, antibiotic policy is adhered to, antibiotic timeout is practiced, prospective audit by the ASP team has helped, 
you have de-escalated and you have made a timely switch from IV to oral. So this is your ASP, which is an ideal ASP in institution. Unfortunately, it is lacking in most of the institutions also. It requires support from the leader of the hospital, the DMS or the uh, chief executive officer. These are the members who should be there. Today in this era of IT, uh, your electronic medical record is of great help. And then connecting between different departments is very easy with IT. Uh, so clinical pharmacist is something which we do not have in many places. In UK, when they implemented AMSP, they did two things. Reporting of Clostridium difficile mandatory, and they raised funds for clinical pharmacist. Clinical pharmacist is an important you know, team member who helps in making guidelines, who helps in assessing the appropriateness of prescription, the prospective audit and feedback. So this is something, and these pharmacists are trained in ID. So uh, these members are missing in our country, and we need to invest in them. And then this team is accountable to clinicians and to the hospital management who have invested. They plan actions to be implemented based on what is available, what is practice. And then they track, they get back to the clinicians, and they also educate the clinicians and public. So this is your ideal AMSP. So in the last two minutes, I'll tell you how to go about establishing anti microstructure program. Remember, AMSP is a stepwise dynamic process. Analyze what is available. Do a situation analysis of structure, the human resources, and the policies which are already in place in your institution. Build on what is available. Identify human resources and form a team with definite terms of references. Identify one member as the leader of the AMSP team. Collect antibody use data from your institution. Standardize medical record and medical chart. That will help you collect this data and track antibiotic use. Work to establish basic microbial laboratory facility. I'm making this point, taking this opportunity that the Dean of Sion Hospital is amongst us. And this is something which can be done at public health hospital also. There are access to improve antibiotic prescribing. Facilitable antibiogram is extremely important. The microbialist can help us. Develop standard treatment guidelines. Educate prescribers, send cultures, check for written indications, review antibiotic treatment with respect to those five days. Review surgical antibiotic prophylaxis, something which can be measured very easily. There are additional interventions, prescription alert, antibiotic timeout, audit feedback, antibiotic restriction, automatic stop order. Having identified the clinical syndrome that you are treating, you can put automatic and the the pharmacy can stop dispensing antibiotics beyond that particular day. Selective lab reporting. This clinical microbiology is so essential for antibiotics. And work to establish regular surveillance activities. Finally, friends, AMSP efforts would also need improved diagnostic facilities. We need to establish point of care, easy to use rapid test, which would ensure that the tests are used to decide antibiotic use. Infection prevention control programs are also extremely important. That would you know, minimize necessity of using antibiotics. There is a need to customize solution of AMSP. There are core elements let down by CDC. Many of them are not easy to implement in our kind of setting. We need to customize and adopt and implement what is doable in our country. But one thing is certain, AMSP have benefited all across the globe. So to conclude, it is the need of the hour that all hospitals in India initiate AMS strategies and start implementing to benefit patients and also for spillover benefits to community by reducing antimicrobial resistance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vijay Yevli, for this wonderful oration on antimicrobial stewardship. We are fortunate to hear the oration from the expert and antimicrobial steward himself, who has guided all of us, especially pediatricians from Navi Mumbai, to become antimicrobial stewards. Thank you so much, sir.
I now invite on stage President-elect 2022, Dr. Upendra Kinzavadekar. Sir, please come on stage. Also, Dr. Madhuri Kulkarni, ma'am, ex-dean LTMG. Ma'am, please come on stage. I also invite on stage Dean LTMG, Dr. Mohan Joshi. And our president, Navi Mumbai IAP, Dr. Jitendra Gavani, sir. Please, sir, all of you, please join us on stage. I now request Dr. Radha Gilbyal to read out the citation. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I will be reading the citation for the Dr. Armida Fernandez Oration 2022, which has been penned by Dr. Shilpa Aroskar. The most extraordinary people in the world do not have a career, they have a calling. And for you, Dr. Vijay Yaule, the calling is pediatrics and infectious diseases, the very breath of life for you. Your beliefs, your vision, and your purpose are driven by passion and guided by perspective. You kick-started the Rational Antibiotic Practice Initiative, which has become a nationwide movement. Your astute clinical skills and evangelical zeal have helped and healed generations of pediatric patients. You led the CIAP as a president and set high benchmarks and infused new perspectives. You know the way, go the way, and show the way to others like a true leader. Your insight and your qualities of integrity and inclusiveness transform the workplace into a second home for your colleagues and subordinates. An academician with more than 30 publications and editorials and 10 orations, you have put IAP on the global map with your innumerable national and international talks. You are a teacher and a mentor to many. You have catapulted their careers, bolstered their confidence, at the same time, guarding them and nurturing them like your own offspring. And yet, your quest to learn more and stay abreast is inspiring and humbling to Generation Next. Your benevolence to work for the community through a public-private sector collaboration, be it polio, typhoid, MMR, or COVID, is fierce and infectious to others. You are not only an expert in monsoon maladies, but also a maestro in musical melodies, enthralling the audience as you play the harmonium. A true and warm-hearted friend to many of us, you have always stood by us, helping us navigate life's challenges. You are a master blaster, the pride of Navi Mumbai IAP, and a true Scion alumni. May God grace your life with health and peace and joy and bliss. We wish that you achieve all that you have ever aspired for. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Vijay Yaule. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, May I request Dr. Madhuri Kulkarni to felicitate Dr. Yevli with a shawl. I request Dr. Jitendra Gavani to felicitate Sir with Shrifal. I request Dr. Upendra Sir to felicitate Dr. Yevle with a bouquet.
May I request Dr. Radha Gildyal and uh, Dr. Mohan Joshi, Dean Sir, to felicitate Dr. Vijay Yevle with the citation plug. <laughs> May I request Dr. Moralva to felicitate Dr. Vijay Yevle with the oration plug. Thank you everyone, thank you for being with us here.